three. The European habit of indiscriminately killing women and children when engaged in hostilities with the natives of the Americas was more than an atrocity. It was flatly and intentionally genocidal. For no population can survive if its women and children are destroyed. Consider the impact of some of the worst instances of modern warfare. In July of 1916, at the start of the First World War, General Douglas Haig sent his British troops into combat with the Germans at the Battle of the Somme. He lost about 60,000 men the very first day, 21,000 in just the first hour, including half his officers. By the time that battle finally ended, Haig had lost 420,000 men, and the war continued for two more years. This truly was far and away the worst war in Britain's history. To make matters worse, since the start of the decade England had been experiencing significant outmigration, and at the end of the decade it was assaulted by a deadly influenza pandemic. Yet between 1911 and 1921, Britain's population increased by about two million people. Or take Japan. Between 1940 and 1950, despite the frenzy of war in the Pacific, capped by the nuclear destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the population of Japan increased by almost 14 percent. Or take Southeast Asia. Between 1960 and 1970, while B-52s were raining destruction from the sky and a horrific ground war was spilling across every national boundary in the region, Southeast Asia's population increased at an average rate of almost 2.5 percent each year. The reason these populations were able to increase, despite massive military damage, was that a greatly disproportionate ratio of men to women and children was being killed. This, however, is not what happened to the indigenous people in the Caribbean, in Mesoamerica, in South America, or in what are now the United States and Canada during the European assault against them. Neither was this slaughter of innocents anything but intentional in design nor did it end with the close of the colonial era. As Richard Drennan has shown in his book Facing West, The Metaphysics of Indian Hating and Empire Building, America's revered founding fathers were themselves activists in the anti-Indian genocide. George Washington, in 1779, instructed Major General John Sullivan to attack the Iroquois and lay waste all the settlements around that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed urging the general not to listen to any overture of peace before the total ruin of their settlements is effected. Sullivan did as instructed, he reported back, destroying everything that contributes to their support, and turning the whole of that beautiful region, wrote one early account, from the character of a garden to a scene of drear and sickening desolation. The Indians, this writer said, were hunted like wild beasts in a war of extermination, something Washington approved of since, as he was to say in 1783, the Indians, after all, were little different from wolves, both being beasts of prey, though they differ in shape. And since the Indians were mere beasts, it followed that there was no cause for moral outrage when it was learned that, among other atrocities, the victorious troops had amused themselves by skinning the bodies of some Indians from the hips downward to make boot tops or leggings. For their part, the surviving Indians later referred to Washington by the nickname Town Destroyer, for it was under his direct orders that at least 28 out of 30 Seneca towns from Lake Erie to the Mohawk River had been totally obliterated in a period of less than five years, as had all the towns and villages of the Mohawk, the Onondaga, and the Cayuga. As one of the Iroquois told Washington to his face in 1792, to this day, when that name is heard, our women look behind them and turn pale, and our children cling close to the necks of their mothers. They might well have clung close to the necks of their mothers when other names were mentioned as well, such as Adams, or Monroe, or Jackson, or Jefferson, for example, who in 1807 instructed his Secretary of War that any Indians who resisted American expansion into their lands must be met with the hatchet. And if ever we are constrained to lift the hatchet against any tribe, he wrote, we will never lay it down till that tribe is exterminated or is driven beyond the Mississippi. Continuing, in war they will kill some of us. We shall destroy all of them.
These were not offhand remarks, for five years later, in 1812, Jefferson again concluded that white Americans were obliged to drive the backward Indians with the beasts of the forests into the Stony Mountains. And one year later still, he added that the American government had no other choice before it than to pursue the Indians to extermination or drive them to new seats beyond our reach. Indeed, Jefferson's writings on Indians are filled with the straightforward assertion that the natives are to be given a simple choice, to be extirpated from the earth or to remove themselves out of the Americans' way. Had these same words been enunciated by a German leader in 1939 and directed at European Jews, they would be engraved in modern memory. Since they were uttered by one of America's founding fathers, however, the most widely admired of the South's slave-holding philosophers of freedom, they conveniently have become lost to most historians in their insistent celebration of Jefferson's wisdom and humanity. In fact, however, to the majority of white Americans by this time, the choice was one of expulsion or extermination, although these were by no means mutually exclusive options. Between the time of initial contact with the European invaders and the close of the 17th century, most eastern Indian peoples had suffered near annihilation levels of destruction. Typically, as in Virginia and New England, 95% or more of their populations had been eradicated. But even then the carnage did not stop. One recent study of population trends in the southeast, for instance, shows that east of the Appalachians in Virginia, the native population declined by 93% between 1685 and 1790. That is, after it already had declined by about 95% during the preceding century, which itself had followed upon the previous century's whirlwind of massive destruction. In eastern North and South Carolina, the decline between 1685 and 1790 was 97%. Again, following upon two earlier centuries of genocidal devastation. In Louisiana, the 1685 to 1790 figure for population collapse was 91 percent, and in Florida, 88 percent. As a result, when the 18th century was drawing to its close, less than 5,000 native people remained alive in all of eastern Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Louisiana combined, while in Florida, which alone contained more than 700,000 Indians in 1520. Only 2,000 survivors could be found. Overwhelmingly, these disasters were the result of massively destructive epidemics and genocidal warfare, while a small portion of the loss in numbers derived from forced expulsion from the Indians' traditional homelands. How these deadly phenomena interacted can be seen clearly by examining the case of the Cherokee. After suffering a calamitous measure of ruination during the time of their earliest encounters with Europeans, the Cherokee population continued to decline steadily and precipitously as the years unfolded. During the late 17th and major part of the 18th century alone, for example, the already devastated Cherokee nation endured the loss of another three-fourths of its population. Then, just as the colonies were going to war in their quest for liberation from the British, they turned their murderous attention one more time to the quest for Indian liquidation. The result for the Cherokee was that their towns is all burned, wrote one contemporary, their corn cut down, and themselves drove into the woods to perish, and a great many of them killed. Before long, observed James Mooney, the Cherokee were on the verge of extinction. Over and over again their towns had been laid in ashes, and their fields wasted. Their best warriors had been killed, and their women and children had sickened and starved in the mountains. Thus, the attempt at straightforward extermination. Next came expulsion. From the precipice of non-existence, the Cherokee slowly struggled back. But as they did, more and more white settlers were moving into and onto their lands. Then in 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected president. The same Andrew Jackson, who once had written that the whole Cherokee nation ought to be scourged. The same Andrew Jackson, who had led troops against peaceful Indian encampments, calling the Indians savage dogs, and boasting that I have on all occasions preserved the scalps of my killed. The same Andrew Jackson, 
who had supervised the mutilation of eight hundred or so Creek Indian corpses, the bodies of men, women, and children that he and his men had massacred, cutting off their noses to count and preserve a record of the dead, slicing long strips of flesh from their bodies to tan and turn into bridle reins. The same Andrew Jackson who, after his presidency was over, still was recommending that American troops specifically seek out and systematically kill Indian women and children who were in hiding in order to complete their extermination. To do otherwise, he wrote, was equivalent to pursuing a wolf in the hammocks without knowing first where her den and whelps were. Almost immediately upon Jackson's ascension to the presidency, the state of Georgia claimed for itself enormous chunks of Cherokee property, employing a fraudulent legal technique that Jackson himself had once used to justify dispossession. The Cherokee and other Indian nations in the region, principally the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Creek, stood fast, even taking their case to the United States Supreme Court. But all the while that they were trying to hold their ground, a flood tide of white immigrants, probably about 40,000 in Cherokee country alone, swarmed over the hills and meadows and woods, their numbers continuing to swell as gold was discovered in one section of the territory. The white settlers, in fact, were part of the government's plan to drive the Indians off their land. As Michael Paul Rogan has demonstrated, the intruders entered Indian country only with government encouragement, under the extension of state law, and once on the Indians' land, they overran it, confiscating the farms of wealthy and poor Indians alike, says Rogan. They took possession of Indian land, stock, and improvements, forced the Indians to sign leases, drove them into the woods, and acquired a bonanza in cleared land. They then destroyed the game, which had supplemented the Indians' agricultural production, with the result, as intended, that the Indians faced mass starvation. Still the Cherokee resisted, and by peaceful means. They won their case before the U.S. Supreme Court with a ruling written by Justice John Marshall, a ruling that led to Jackson's famous remark, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. The court, of course, had no direct means of enforcement, so the drive against the Cherokee and the other Indians of the region continued unabated. Finally, a treaty was drawn up, ceding the Cherokee lands to the American government in exchange for money and some land in what had been designated Indian territory far to the west. Knowing that neither the Cherokee elders nor the majority of the Cherokee people would approve the treaty, the U.S. government held the most influential Cherokee leader in jail and shut down the tribal printing press while negotiations took place between American officials and a handful of cooperative Indians. Even the American military official who was on hand to register the tribe's members for removal protested to the Secretary of War that that paper called a treaty is no treaty at all, because not sanctioned by the great body of the Cherokee and made without their participation or assent. I solemnly declare to you that upon its reference to the Cherokee people it would be instantly rejected by nine-tenths of them, and I believe by nineteen-twentieths of them. But the President had what he wanted, someone's signature on a piece of paper. This was what the great French observer of American life, Alexis de Tocqueville, was speaking of when he remarked sarcastically that, in contrast with the 16th century Spanish, in the 19th century, and we might add here the 20th, the conduct of the United States Americans toward the natives was inspired by the most chaste affection for legal formalities. It is impossible to destroy men with more respect to the laws of humanity. Soon the forced relocation, what was to become known as the Trail of Tears, began under the direction of General Winfield Scott. In fact, the relocation was nothing less than a death march, a presidentially ordered death march that, in terms of the mortality rate directly attributable to it, was almost as destructive as the Bataan Death March of 1942 the most notorious Japanese atrocity in all of the Second World War. About 22,000 Cherokee then remained in existence, 4,000 of whom had already broken under the pressures of white oppression and left for Indian territory. Another thousand or so escaped and hid out in the Carolina Hills. The remaining 17,000 were rounded up by the American military and herded into detention camps, holding pens, really, 
where they waited under wretched and ignominious conditions for months, as preparations for their forced exile were completed. James Mooney, who interviewed people who had participated in the operation, described the scene. Under Scott's orders, the troops were disposed at various points throughout the Cherokee country, where stockade forts were erected for gathering in and holding the Indians preparatory to removal. From these, squads of troops were sent to search out with rifle and bayonet every small cabin hidden away in the coves or by the sides of mountain streams, to seize and bring in as prisoners all the occupants, however or wherever they might be found. Families at dinner were startled by the sudden gleam of bayonets in the doorway, and rose up to be driven with blows and oaths along the weary miles of trail that led to the stockade. Men were seized in their fields or going along the road. Women were taken from their wheels and children from their play. In many cases, on turning one last look as they crossed the ridge, they saw their homes in flames, fired by the lawless rabble that followed on the heels of the soldiers to loot and pillage. So keen were these outlaws on the scent that in some instances they were driving off the cattle and other stock of the Indians almost before the soldiers had fairly started their owners in the other direction. Systematic hunts were made by the same men for Indian graves, to rob them of the silver pendants, and other valuables deposited with the dead. A Georgia volunteer, afterward a colonel in the Confederate service, said, I fought through the Civil War, and have seen men shot to pieces and slaughtered by thousands, but the Cherokee removal was the cruelest work I ever knew. An initial plan to carry the Cherokee off by steamboat in the hottest part of the summer, was called off when so many of them died from disease and the oppressive conditions. After waiting for the fall season to begin, they were then driven overland, in groups upwards of about a thousand, across Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, and Missouri. One white traveler from Maine happened upon several detachments from the death march, all of them suffering extremely from the fatigue of the journey and the ill health consequent upon it. The last detachment which we passed on the 7th embraced rising 2,000 Indians. We found the road literally filled with the procession for about three miles in length. The sick and feeble were carried in wagons, about as comfortable for traveling as a New England ox cart with a covering over it. A great many ride on horseback, and multitudes go on foot. Even aged females, apparently nearly ready to drop into the grave, were traveling with heavy burdens attached to the back, on the sometimes frozen ground and sometimes muddy streets, with no covering for the feet except what nature had given them. We learned from the inhabitants on the road where the Indians passed that they buried fourteen or fifteen at every stopping place, and they make a journey of ten miles per day only on an average. Like other government-sponsored Indian death marches, this one intentionally took native men, women, and children through areas where it was known that cholera and other epidemic diseases were raging. The government sponsors of this march, again as with the others, fed the Indians spoiled flour and rancid meat, and they drove the native people on through freezing rain and cold. Not a day passed without numerous deaths from the unbearable conditions under which they were forced to travel, and when they arrived in Indian territory, many more succumbed to fatal illness and starvation. All told, by the time it was over, more than 8,000 Cherokee men, women, and children died as a result of their expulsion from their homeland. That is, about half of what then remained of the Cherokee nation was liquidated under presidential directive, a death rate similar to that of other southeastern peoples who had undergone the same process.